Imagine everything around you, the chair you're sitting on, the device you're watching this on, the very room you're in, is nothing but an elaborate illusion being fed into your brain. Sounds like a bad sci-fi movie, right? But it's a real philosophical nightmare scenario. What if you're just a brain in a vat, living in a simulated reality? If that idea makes your head spin, you're not alone. Philosophers, scientists, and sci-fi writers have been obsessing over this for centuries. Today, we're going to dig deep into the brain in a vat concept, from its dusty philosophical origins to cutting-edge neuroscience labs and from Descartes to the Matrix. Buckle up for a wild ride through reality, illusion, and everything in between. Let's jump into that hair hole, because I've already finished with rabbit ones. What would it take, in practical terms, to have a living brain in a jar? Setting aside the simulation for a moment, let's go full Frankenstein. Can you keep a brain alive outside its body? Incredibly, and creepily, scientists have been trying versions of this for over a century, with some success. This is the biological side of the brain in a vat question. Not how do we know, but could it be done for real? The history of isolated brain experiments is equal parts fascinating and ghastly. Back in 1812, a French physiologist named Julien Jean César Legal theorized about reviving decapitated heads by hooking up blood supply. Fortunately, he didn't get very far beyond theory. By the mid-19th century, others were trying. In 1857, Charles Brown Sequard, a name only a Victorian scientist could have, actually decapitated a dog and after a full 10 minutes, injected oxygenated blood into the head's arteries. Disturbingly, the dog's eyes opened and its muzzle twitched a bit before finally shutting down again. It was like a very brief, partial revival of a severed head. That must have been a sight in the lab. Fast forward to 1928 in the Soviet Union. Here we meet Sergei Brukonenko, who demonstrated something straight out of a horror film. He kept a severed dog's head alive for an extended period using a primitive heart-lung machine of his invention. This device, called the autojector, pumped blood into the dog's head. According to reports, the isolated dog head could blink, react to sounds, even lick its nose, all while detached from any body. Yes, this really happened and was filmed as part of a Soviet research documentary. As you can imagine, it raised all kinds of ethical eyebrows and probably inspired a few movie scripts. The key point, it showed that a mammalian head with brain inside could be kept biologically functional for a while outside its body responding to stimuli. It's important to note we have no idea what the dog felt or experienced. Was it conscious in those moments? Or were those just reflexes firing? We don't know. And frankly, we'd rather not put any more dogs through that to find out. In the late 20th century, American neurosurgeon Robert J. White took things further. In 1963, White managed to isolate a monkey's brain, just the brain, and hook it into another animal's blood circulation to keep it alive. A few years later, he performed an even more infamous experiment, transplanting one monkey's whole head onto another monkey's body. The transplanted head reportedly regained consciousness. It could see, hear, taste. Basically, it was a living monkey head on a different body, though paralyzed from the neck down since the spinal cord wasn't connected. It survived like eight or nine days. That's more head transplant than brain in vat, but it's related. The brain was kept alive separate from its original body. White's experiments were highly controversial, for obvious reasons, but they demonstrated that a brain could potentially be sustained, at least short term, outside its original body by plugging into some life support system. Meanwhile, other scientists found less brutal ways to study isolated brains. In 1993, researcher Rodolfo Linas captured a live guinea pig's entire brain in a dish with a special fluid circulation system. The guinea pig brain survived about eight hours in vitro, and amazingly, the electrical activity, brain waves, looked very similar to what you'd see in a normal, in-body brain. Think about that. A brain, sitting in a lab dish, firing on all cylinders, at least for a while, as if it were still snug in a skull. Again, was the guinea pig brain conscious, or just running on autopilot? Hard to say. The brain was essentially asleep, no sensory input, but the neurons were alive and communicating. Leap ahead to very recent times. 2019. Scientists at Yale made headlines by reviving cellular function in pig brains hours after the pigs had died. They used a system called BrainX, basically a sophisticated chemical perfusion to restore circulation in the pig brains four hours post-mortem. The result? The brain cells started functioning again. They consumed oxygen and sugar, produced CO2, maintained some metabolic activity. However, and this is crucial, they made sure there was no organized electrical activity in these brains. In other words, the brains were not allowed to wake up. 
They were kept in a sort of zombie state, alive at the cellular level, but not firing in conscious patterns. The researchers blocked neuronal firing on purpose, using chemicals because, ethically, the last thing you want is to accidentally resurrect a disembodied brain and have it start suffering or panicking. As one of the Yale team put it, this is not a living brain, but it is a cellularly active brain. The line between life and death got very blurry. The pig brain wasn't dead dead, but it wasn't alive in any meaningful way either. What it did show is that the window for restoring some brain function after blood flow stops is bigger than we thought, which has huge implications for medicine and maybe one day for preserving brains. And it didn't stop there. In 2023, researchers at University of Texas Southwestern went a step further in living animals. They developed a system to divert a live pig's blood circulation to an external machine just for the brain, effectively isolating the brain's blood supply while the pig was still anesthetized alive. This extracorporeal pulsatile perfusion system could regulate the brain's blood flow and pressure independently of the body. The result? The pig's brain activity and health markers remain normal for hours, even while its brain was essentially on an isolated circulation loop. After the experiment, they returned the pig's blood flow to normal, and the pig woke up, presumably with no idea its brain had been on a solo trip. This demonstrated a controlled way to study a brain in isolation from the rest of the body for hours, without killing the animal. In plainer terms, we are getting closer to being able to maintain an awake, functioning brain apart from its body, at least temporarily and with a lot of high-tech support. So scientifically, keeping a brain alive outside a body is looking more feasible than ever, though doing it with full consciousness still hasn't been achieved on purpose. The remaining huge hurdle, sensory input and output. An isolated brain with no inputs is like a person in a totally dark, silent room with no senses, or perhaps more extremely, like a person in a coma. What would a brain experience if it was fully alive but deprived of all sensory data? Likely not much. Maybe it would dream, or maybe it would just be disoriented and then slip into unconsciousness. The brain expects input. In fact, there have been sad cases of humans with certain severe injuries or conditions, like advanced locked-in syndrome or complete sensory sensory loss, where the person's brain is basically trapped with minimal input dar output. Those suggest that a brain can only remain sane for so long without interaction. So our mad scientists, if they want their invaded brain to have a normal conscious experience, can't just keep the brain alive, they need to plug it into something to simulate a world. And that brings us to brain-computer interfaces and virtual reality in a very real sense. But before we move on, let's appreciate how far the biology has come. We've gone from wild speculation about severed heads to actual experiments where brains and bits of brains are being kept alive or even functionally interactive outside the body. It's no longer purely theoretical, at least on the level of cells and basic brain activity the brain can survive in a jar of fluid with the right tech supporting it. That's a big tick in the possible column for the brain in a VAT scenario. The remaining piece of the puzzle is can that brain be conscious and experience a reality? For that, we need to hook it up, and that's where neuroscience and engineering collide. 